In northwestern Ontario, the question of safely managing nuclear waste is gaining urgency. There was a meeting at Grand Council Treaty No. 3 this weekend to discuss nuclear waste storage in Treaty 3 territory near Ignace. Here's some information. It's James with Net News Ledger. Nisha and Audrey are in the studio today. We're talking about nuclear waste in northwestern Ontario. Ladies, what's the issue? Um, the issue is that, uh, my personal issue is that it's going to contaminate uh, the waterways and it's going to cause uh, detrimental effects into the environment that will probably much last a long, long time. What we're seeing is a lot of push coming out of the nuclear waste storage to be in the Ignace area and with an underground storage. What would happen? How does the material come from southern Ontario and the nuclear plants? How would it get here, first of all? Let's, let's follow the path. So all southern Ontario gets power. Northwestern Ontario will sit and wait for the nuclear waste to arrive. What's the path for it to get here? The Trans-Canada, um, they pretty much, they're trying to um, pick a route to transport the nuclear waste from southern Ontario to northwestern Ontario. So they haven't um, decided if they're going to transport it uh, via highway um, with the transportation truckers or they're going to pass it through the, the trains. So over the course of the past six months, we've had numerous days with transport trucks sitting in the ditch all along Highway 11, all the way along Highway 17 from literally Sault Ste. Marie all the way north up into Geraldton. We've seen accidents between here and Nipigon. We've had Shabakwa Corners, all kinds of accidents. Is this a safe way to bring things into Northern Ontario like this? No. What would be more acceptable, Audrey? Well, they were, that's one of the questions that came up at that Grand Council Treaty 3 where Nisha and I just came from. Yes. And they spent two days talking about the, uh, about nuclear waste. And that had to do with the Ignace site, and they were looking for at the high-level waste. And they were talking about the methods of transportation to Chalk River, and they said it was low-level in those semis. So what they said was uh, they, uh, they tested extensively to ensure integrity through worst accidents possible. That was approved by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. And one of the questions then was, we were not aware of what you were doing at Pinawa. And they explained uh, how long that had been taking place. So, you know, the question is asked, how can Native people, some agree with this and, and some don't? Well, there was a lot of people who didn't know anything about it because uh, that waste disposal, or, or you can go on and tell, because you know the area, Nisha, because you're <coughs> from here, and you know about Pinawa. They just told us about that, what happened there. Oh, the story that, the that was shared? the laboratory, that 50 years that had been in that place. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew about that place. It was like one of those top secret, you know, hidden places that nobody was supposed to hear about. But um, I guess at this time, you know, they kind of got discovered, and now they had not much choice but to come out and try to be all like, hey, this is what we're doing and this is what we have been doing and this is what we've been transporting, you know, through your communities, but we never told you. But, you know, so there, there was a lot of secrecy and they kind of like had to show face as to like, you know, what they were doing. With and that's why I keep, they come up with this monitoring program and, uh, and they call it, uh, that's why they're going to the First Nations people because they're, what they're doing is they're pulling in the traditional knowledge so that they can then incorporate it into their plan. They have seven environmental specialists that they have there that they said um, they're looking at what might impact the environment and then uh, doing the as assessment. Uh, so they're doing site and project inspections uh, and they're testing upstream, downstream, they're testing wild foods, berries, mushrooms, wild rice. So they're reporting on all of the things that uh, First Nations uh, way of life and culture is dependent on. So what they're doing now is they're trying to take that and move that into their programs. And then they're going to take uh, Native people 
who, who are, who look after it. We are the ones who watch over the land. That was our role. But now they're going to take that even and use that under the programming money, under this program that, uh, that, w that actually funded this whole thing. Now, of the seven experts that they have, how many are Indigenous? Uh, I don't think it says there was a co-creation Indigenous community that worked with Saugeen. And the new, they had a newsletter. They said they had results. They had something about the Black River, hollow water. They were looking at biodiversity, emissions to the water. They're looking at radiological groundwater, spring water. And, and some elders there said that the people are getting cancer from that water already. That's not being documented. We're, we're seeing that out of, out of grassy narrows from Dryden to right through the whole water system. We're seeing issues like that. And mm -hmm. it's a problem. And I mean, we, we did an interview with David Suzuki. And David Suzuki said just to clean that part of the river up from the pulp and paper would be a billion dollar project. And we've seen nothing move on it. The, the, the town of Ignace and a lot of the First Nations, including Grand Council Treaty 3, are receiving funding for this. Do you think that funding is to research and to inform the public? Well, I think Nisha probably knows more about that than I do. Um, are you talking about to learn more money? Yes. Oh, wow. All yeah. right, here we go. <laughs> so the learn more money, um, from my understanding, is that um, when you pay your hydro bill, a percentage of that money goes into the Learn More Fund, and that's where they're generating the money so they can um, gift First Nations communities. They can, you know, give money to townships. They can give money to uh, different um, cities, you know, for example, and to also help in the purchase of certain, you know, essentials. Um, so they're pretty much, you know, buying their way into the lives of the Anishinaabe people. And the money that's being, that's being given away, it's money that, you know the word I'm going to use. It, it's, it's a word that's so, um, it offends the Nuclear Waste Management Organization because, you know, they'll get angry at me and everything. But it's bribery, you know, at, at its finest. You know, it's 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 um, it's going into communities and and enticing them to like you know to like here we have something for you, um, well but we're going to give you this you know first, and and then well hopefully we'll get your consent. So it's it's all about obtaining consent from the different communities around Wabagoon and within Wabagoon. So I don't agree with the fact that you know there's only one community. There's only one community that has a say in this whole entire northern development. So I think it's an it's a entire northwestern Ontario decision because there's so many different people that live along the waterways and it's going to affect every single person and ecological and like just it's going to affect the environment. And the money that they're putting into um, these organizations to go into communities and to um, openly harm the environment, the people, and the communities, that, that has to be looked into because you know what, there's, there has to be accountability to like where the money is going, how it's being spent, and some communities receive that money and they don't do anything with that money, they just keep it. But where's that money going? Like in my community, like you know, nuclear waste, they came in and they offered, um, there was a lot of money given to the Ojibwe Nation of Saugeen, the um, the one in Savant Lake location, and we still don't know what happened to that money. Two hundred thousand dollars disappeared. A nuclear waste just rode off as like you know, well we don't know what happened to that money, so that's pretty much the end of that. And now um, with the new leadership that we have, um, they're planning on signing a new agreement so they're able to obtain more money. And as a community member. Um, who's been advocating against nuclear waste, I don't think it's correct because that money doesn't go anywhere except for the pockets of the people that want to spend it. How should decisions on that be made? Should there be a community-wide referendum? <clears throat> well, that's one of the things that they were talking about because, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in our uh, culture as Indigenous people, all of our peoples, 
we talk about governance and we talk about self-determination. But that's within the context of how Canada is run in terms of a democracy, they call it a capitalist democracy. Mm -hmm. But First Nations, in our traditional ways, in order to make a decision, an important decision that would affect a whole community, it was necessary for everyone to sit around that table, everyone to discuss what was going on, everybody to know, and everyone to have a say. And if that took uh, you know, a week, two weeks, three weeks, a year, it didn't matter. It would take, we would take that time, our people would take that time to make that decision. When these decisions were made, when the treaties came in, it's very much similar in what's going on now. They, the people that came in and made those treaties with our people brought in trinkets. You know, they brought in a few little tools for our people. And they knew what they were doing. And that's exactly what's happening now. Because our people uh, are in poverty. Our people, I see the housing that they're living in. This was my very first time I went on this reserve out here. I see the housing and how it's comparable to what is Canadian housing. It's inferior. And so um, they're talking now about Indigenous engagement. When it says here, there was a question, when you talk about Indigenous engagement, when did you start and when did you start talking to the Native people around? They said there was a comprehensive report that came out in 2002. So they say, so you can't say in 20, 30, 10 years? They couldn't say. They couldn't give any kind of uh, report or information that had taken place over that period of time. So what's going on now is a rush job. And it's not fair to uh, our people as, a, as the people of this land because our people here, have, and one of the things that was noted was our people have treaties with the federal government. Those treaties say that that crown land protected under the crown. The crown does not own it. Canada does not own that land. That is all First Nations land. And their role was to protect it, not to take it. So that's what's going on now, and that's what's not clear in Canada here. And, and the, the ministers who are in charge, who are supposed to make that known to the Canadian public, are not making it known. So anybody who's coming in here from another country they're allowing them to come in and take leases on First Nations land for mining, for the pipeline, for whatever they want. And this is the Canadian government of Canada. So Canadians now are in that same position as we are. Because where now is Canadian relevance in all of this? And that's what Canadians have to ask themselves. When the treaty is with the Crown, um Justin Trudeau or the Prime Minister of Canada doesn't wear a crown. The yeah, Governor it General... Was, it was passed over to the responsibility because what people don't know that Indian Affairs was the first department that was made in, Can in this country mm -hmm. under Canada. It wasn't even made yet. Canada wasn't even here yet. But all of the money through trade was going through this economic already system that they were putting but they had nowhere to put it. So they sent it back to Britain. They kept it there. Well, when Canada became Canada, they wanted that money back. And all of that money is Indian money. So all Indian affairs is all the transactions that go through those treaties. All that money is landing in the lap of the federal government, who now takes that money and puts it into programs and services and calls it that they're giving us money. Well, that's our money. Mm -hmm. So this is all twisted that they're not telling people. And now they're bringing in corporations from everywhere to come into native land because they think they have the right. But our people, those ones who have treaty, the treaty, they're the signatories, like her, mm -hmm. you know, to this <clears throat> land. She, her, her grandfather, her father's land, her trap line, her father's trap line, they just went and put themselves on there and took that land. Right here. Mm -hmm. The rings of fire. That's, that's like the... Um, Something we've covered is with, in British Columbia with the unceded territory exactly. with, with, with Heswin and the literally Canada's invading yeah. a sovereign other nation. Yeah, they are. You know, and if 
it's got many, a lot of Canadians get really confused by all of this. And I, you know, I hear what you're saying because they come in and go, oh, oh, here's some money. You can do, you know, whatever you'd like with it, whatever, whatever you want, which will help, quote unquote, help your community. Which is like a $5 treaty annuity, which is what they said they would give to us. And most yeah. of us never got that. That was per year. Yeah. And they well, never you, increased it. When you really look at the treaty, some of them, uh, Treaty 3, uh, the Treaty in Nikakusa Minakani, the family is to, supposed to get farming implements and they're supposed to get seed and other things that they need to farm. Mm -hmm. And they've people today, that would never happen. Mm -hmm. But it's basically not, okay, you need a new tractor. The treaty is talking about shovels. You know, and it's very much like the, the $5 annuity, which probably costs the government more money to send up an RCMP officer to stand there in his red surge and help hand it out than the money they're giving out. And that's why that's so difficult for us as Native people of this land to know why that could happen when this is supposed to be what they call a right uh, society. You know, they said that they were right and they brought all this here and now not only do we have to live with it, but everybody else who's come to this land has to live with it. And it's called colonialism. And now it's, in, and it's all three powers, political power, military power, and economic power. And that's exactly what is under, the, under this colonial law that we live under. And that's the reality of it. Absolutely. Now, moving into the nuclear waste area, that's huge economic. And, you know, we get told that we need the nuclear waste and it's not going to generate carbon into the atmosphere and all the, the quote unquote good things about nuclear waste that, or nuclear energy, sorry, that you hear. But there's not a lot of discussion on the amount of waste, how long that waste is going to take to become safe. And you know, the half-life on this stuff is, is a long time. What, what were they talking about on that this weekend? On the waste? On the waste. Well, there were questions about it because people don't really know. Mm -hmm. they, they came to them with scientific, you know, with all, with a brochure like this. You know, very well done. How many people looked through it? I don't know. You know, cost a lot, but explains nothing. But what I can hear the people say themselves from what they've gone through and what they don't know, it pretty well tells you everything, that, that how the nuclear industry has handled this. And this nuclear nexus, I mean, it's been funded by the federal government from the start. And, you know, we, and somebody explained that to us today from an, a friend of Misha's. And he explained that to us from the very beginning. He talked to us about energy. Mm -hmm. Well, this is about weapons and what's being made from this nuclear and the weapons that are being made to kill people and was from the very beginning. So that part is completely eliminated out of the question now when in fact it's all wrapped up with that, with the industrial military complex. What's next? For us? Yes. Um, we were invited to go to uh, Kenora, um, to the Anishinaabe Park, to uh, gather in, uh, on June 21st, the National Aboriginal Day, Anishinaabe Day, and we're going to go. Um, we're going to go sit with the elders and the people of uh, Grand Council Treaty Three, and pretty much whoever decides to come up and support um, each other um, in the fight against nuclear waste. Uh, tomorrow we fly back to Ottawa. Well, I fly back. To, I, I'm just <laughs> right now. I'm getting all excited. But no, um, I'm going back to Ottawa, and I think on the 28th we're going to head back to Parliament Hill because um, uh, the Algonquin people are opposing the Chalk River facility. But then this morning, was it this morning? It was yesterday morning mm -hmm. where we're staying in the Super 8. Mm -hmm. A gentleman was there having breakfast, and he said that he lives just down the road from the Chalk River. And he said that there's non-stop cement trucks going in there. 
So they already started. He said what he said. This is a diversion. He said they already decided where they're going to put it. It's Chalk River, he said. So. That's. So it's an evolving story, and we're going to have to keep talking as we go forward. We will. We'll have to. Otherwise, you know, what, what's next, like he said. Lucia and Audrey, thanks for coming in. Thanks for talking with us today. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for, Thanks having, for us. having us. Like what you see? Subscribe, hit the like button, and make sure to get the notifications.